Well, good morning. morning. We are going to continue in our study through soteriology, and uh, I'm going to pray for us, ask for the Lord's help, and we are going to dive right in. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are a glorious God, and you are mighty to save. You have accomplished wondrous deeds more than we can recount. And this morning, we want to look into your word to see all that you have done. And we want to praise you for it. And we want to be humbled by it. We want to submit our hearts and our minds to it. And we ask that your spirit would be present to teach us about all that you have done and that you were mighty to save. We love you, Lord, and we pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, to review quickly what we talked about last week, we kind of gave a little bit of a history of TULIP. We're studying the doctrines of grace as uh, we're going through this doctrine of soteriology, which is the doctrine of salvation. And we wanted to see that um, even in history, it teaches us and tells us that there was objections that were made and that these were actually five responses and standing firm on what we see as reformed theology uh, that seeks to exalt and magnify God for his glory and to submit to the authority of scripture. And we saw last week that we looked at the first point, which was total depravity. We saw the consequence of sin is death, that the impact of sin was on um, our minds, our hearts, and our wills as individuals, but also on all of mankind. All of us and all of us are impacted by sin. And that scripture teaches that the, the ultimate condition of the sinner is that we are unable to respond to God in our own strength, that there is a, what we call, inability in man alone. And then we closed out with talking about the unity of these doctrines, that God is the one who saves sinners. And that's the point that we want to see all throughout these points. And so today, as we move forward, we want to look at the next uh, point in the acronym, the response to the complaint about election from the Arminians. So the response was, we could title it, unconditional election, unconditional election. And this morning, we want to take a little bit of time to compare the Arminian view with the Calvinist view. And primarily where we want to spend our time is reading through scripture. We want to look at God's word to say, what does God say about this topic of election? And we want to submit our hearts and our minds to it as we review some definitions and look through God's word together. So before we jump into the disagreements, I thought it would be helpful to start briefly with where do we agree? Where do we agree? And the first point we need to recognize is that um, no matter what side you're on, there's a reality of this truth in God's word. We can't just say, well, I don't really like this idea of election. I don't think the Bible really talks about it, so let's just set it aside. No, both parties would agree that this is a subject talked about in scripture. So we need to understand what is being communicated about this topic of election. We also need to say uh, that there's unity in regards to the goal. The goal of election is to save sinners. That's the goal we see described in scripture. We also see that the author of the, uh, this doctrine of election is God the Father. That God the Father is the one who elects sinners for salvation. And we'll Um, also see throughout our passages today the time. There's agreement in regards to the time that this happened in eternity past. So I want to mention these up front because as we go through these passages, you're going to see a lot of distinction point out, but we also need to see the unity in regards to where we stand on this. And there's several um, other denominations of Christianity that, that would just say, I don't believe in that election stuff. And what we need to be able to say is, It's in the Bible, so you have to have a position on it. You have to actually agree and submit to Scripture as the authority. So having seen some agreements, let's look together at the distinctions. In the Arminian camp, they would um, hold up, in regards to bullet points, they would say it's conditional, that um, the Scripture teaches that there's a foreseen of facts, and that there's um, man's will involved in God's choosing of who would be saved. Whereas in comparison, the Calvinist view would say that it is unconditional, that God foreloved or set his love upon his chosen elect, and that it's by God's will alone. And so first, let's look through some statements together. Let's look through some statements in regards to the Arminian view. According to the Arminian view, God's choice and election of certain individuals for salvation before the foundation of the world was based upon God's foreseeing that they 
mankind would respond to his call. God selected only those he knew would of themselves freely believe the gospel. Election, therefore, was determined by or conditioned upon what man in himself would do. The faith which God foresaw and upon which he based his choice was not given to the sinner by God, meaning it wasn't created by the regeneration of the Holy Spirit in their life, but rather it resulted solely from man's will alone. Also, it was left entirely up to man to determine who would believe and therefore who would be elected for salvation. God chose those whom he knew of their own free will would choose Christ. Thus, the sinner's choice of Christ, not God's choice of the sinner, is the ultimate cause of salvation. And this really gets us to the, the linchpin in the argument. The distinction here is not over the reality of Scripture or who does uh, who ultimately, well, it is about who ultimately chose. And what we say theologically is the basis. So the disagreement here is what is the basis for God's choosing? And that's where these parties distinctly disagree. And from um, a biblical view of the Arminian camp, we would say that this really is a view that presents God as some sort of cosmic Uber driver and mankind is in the back seat and they're just telling him where to take them. Ultimately, he's just delivering them to where their will wants to go, whether to heaven or hell. And we need to understand that that is not what the Bible teaches. In comparison, if we compare it to the Calvinist view of the Bible, we would say that God's choice and election of certain individuals for salvation before the foundation of the world rested solely in his sovereign will. God's choice of particular sinners was not based on any foreseen response or even obedience on the part of man, such as faith or repentance. On the contrary, God gives faith and repentance, as we've seen in our study already, and he gives it to each individual whom he selected. And it means, meaning this specifically, these acts, faith and repentance, are the result of God's choice, not the cause of God's choice. And because of this, election, therefore, must not be and was not determined by or conditioned upon any virtuous quality or act foreseen in man. Those whom God sovereignly elected, he brings through the power of the Spirit to a willing acceptance of Christ. Thus, Christ, or excuse me, thus God's choice of the sinner, not the sinner's choice of Christ, is the ultimate cause of salvation. Now, we do need to have some clarifying statements. We need to understand that unconditional here does not refer to say that there are no conditions for salvation. We've already seen that faith and repentance can rightly be stated as requirements for salvation. What we need to clarify here is that election does not equal salvation. Rather, election is God's choice in eternity past of who would be saved. Election refers to God's plan of salvation. The act of election itself did not save anyone. What it did was mark out certain individuals who will be saved. He marks them out for salvation. Think of like um, if you're a, a woodcraft person, you get a lumber and you take your measuring tape, you spread it over and you make marks where you're gonna cut. Marking that wood doesn't actually accomplish the cut but it marks out where you plan to and will make those cuts. We must understand, though, that this doctrine of election must also, on the contrary, not be divorced from uh, these other doctrines that we've talked about. We can't divorce it from the doctrines of human guilt or redemption or regeneration. We must see it in relation to the entire Trinitarian act of salvation. We see that God the Father in the past planned salvation. We see that the Son, his redeeming work of giving himself is to save the elect, and that the Spirit of God brings the elect to faith in Christ. He applies salvation. So we must always remember that the triune God is at work in every part of salvation. God the Father planned salvation, God the Son accomplished salvation, and God the Spirit applies salvation for the elect. Having laid out these two views of divine election, let's look at what Scripture teaches us on the subject. 
As we've heard in the past, and we want to continue this morning, as we want to make sure that our goal is to hear and believe and submit to what Scripture says about this topic. That's the goal of a systematic study. We are going to look at several passages of Scripture regarding the doctrine of election to find what is the basis of divine election. That is, why and on what grounds are some elected to salvation and life? and others not. And we need to wrestle through these things. We may, like Jacob, walk away with a bit of a mental lip, limp, excuse me, possibly this morning, but we will be able to rejoice in our total dependence on God and his amazing grace all the more for it. So first off, we need to set our minds on the right track this morning. We need to remember that mankind is sinful. We are hopeless apart from God. We are rebels against God, and he is a holy, righteous judge who must judge sinners. And we need to look at who God is. And so some of these verses we've already looked at, but in the topic of election, we need to make sure to set our minds on the right track to say, who is God? How does Scripture talk about God and his power and his purpose and his will? Let's start with Job 42, 1 through 2. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you, speaking to God, can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Psalm 135, 6, whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all deeps. Psalm 115, 3, our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Isaiah 46, 8 through 11. Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done. Saying, my my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose, calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my counsel from a far country. I have spoken, and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed, and I will do it. We see repeated in these verses that God is sovereign, that his purpose will stand, and it cannot be stopped. We see that the Lord is sovereign over all things, and the one of those terms in scripture that points this out is this term, predestination predestination this term predestination could be synonymous for words like ordain or decree or determine this shows God's sovereign power and generally when this term is talked about in scripture it refers to God's eternal and uninfluenced determination of all things but specifically with our topic of election this morning it refers to God's eternal choice of those who will be saved and those who will be passed over and condemned for their sins. Let's look at some passages that specifically talk about this idea of destined or predestined in Scripture. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 9 through 10 says, For God has not destined us for wrath, but rather destined us to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2, 8 and 9 says, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. He says, they stumble because they disobey the word. And he says, as they were destined to do. But, rather, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. In Ephesians 1, verse 11, it says, in him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined, according to the purpose of him, the purpose of God, which we just looked at. His purposes will always stand. It says, according to his purpose, and then Paul expands this thought of saying of who God is. He says, who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So we need to understand this morning, how does predestination correlate or relate to this idea of election? Well, if we have Um, a diagram here that includes everything. Um, I was reading a quote this morning from Spurgeon who talked about dust motes 
and that God is sovereign over even every little atom, every little dust mote, doesn't move or stand in place apart from God's predestined sovereign will. And we need to understand that this morning if we're going to look at this election. And in this circle includes everything that God has predestined, everything God has ordained and planned to accomplish. And when we speak of election, what we're saying is this is, if we colored in a small area, this would be a subset of God's overarching purposes and plans. This is one of the topics we could talk about that God has predestined. And so when we zoom in, we understand that God's overall purposes will always stand. And if this is one of his purposes, this is according to his will, it also will be accomplished. We would say in math terms that election is a subset of predestination. So now that we've talked about predestination and God's purposes, what exactly do we mean by this term election? When, when scripture speaks of election, it means God's decision in choosing a special group or certain persons for salvation. This term is especially used of the predestination of individuals, individual recipients, that is, of salvation. Scripture also uses this word chose oftentimes in scripture referring to election, or he'll say the elect, meaning the people that he has chosen by God, that God has chosen. So we need to understand this idea of election, and we want to understand it according to scripture, and there's really three categories we can see election in scripture. We see it in service, God elects people for specific services or offices. We see prophet, priest, king, the Levites uh, were priests that were elected for service. Even specific judges were appointed. But we also see this idea of corporate. There's this corporate election where God chose the people of Israel, not because of anything of them, but he decided, it says in Deuteronomy 7, to set his love upon them. And we also see this idea in scripture of individual selection or individual choice and election for salvation. And so that's primarily the vein that we want to look at this morning to say, how does God elect? What's the basis for this? First Thessalonians 1.4 says, For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you. Ephesians 1 verses 3 and 4 said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13 but we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. We also see that Scripture speaks of this specific idea of individuals. This isn't just a, a large corporate group that he's choosing in the church or some sort of corporate decision. It's individual. And we see this twice in the book of Revelation. Revelation 13 says, and all authority, oh, excuse me, and authority was given to the beast over every tribe and people and language and nation, and all who dwell on the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the lamb who was slain. There's this idea that names are actually written down before the foundation of the world individual names. We see it again in Revelation 17. And the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. So we need to see that there's clearly this identification of individuals being chosen by God before the foundation of the world. So we also want to look this morning at what is this, uh, you could say, according to you? And there's this phrase you could search in scripture. There's multiple times when God speaks of his election, his choice, and he says, what is my choice according to? What is it, what is it based on? And Ephesians 1 verse 5 says, he being God predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. And he says, according to God's predestination for us is according to, he says, the purpose of his will. Romans 8, 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called, he says, according to his purpose. 
2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 says, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who saved us and called us to a holy calling. How did this happen? He says, not because of our works, but rather, he says, because of his being God's own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus when? Before the ages began. We need to see through Scripture its constant testimony about God's choosing for salvation is according to God's purpose. It's according to God's purpose, which cannot be thwarted, cannot be stopped. If God's purpose always stands, and his election of those who will be saved is according to his purpose, then election must stand no matter what. And we would say, theologically speaking, the term here would be God's choosing is unconstrained. There is no constraining factor that that God's purposes can be thwarted or stopped. It will stand. It will be accomplished according to his will. But we also see some verses in scripture that speak of God choosing according to foreknowledge. So let's look at those next. What is this idea of foreknowledge? We see that it's according to his purpose, that he's predestined them, but we also see scripture talking about this idea of of foreknowledge. First Peter chapter 1 opens the letter with St. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and who he's writing to. He says, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And he says, these elect exiles, he says, they're elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Again, we see in Romans chapter 8, looking beyond verse 28 that we saw previously. It says that uh, for those called according to his purpose, in verse 29 he continues, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. We need to understand that the author's intent when using this word for foreknowledge or foreknew is either going to be one of two choices presented in these views. It's either God means to say in his word that he foresaw facts or he foreloved people. And it's interesting if you look at these verses, especially in Romans chapter 8, you'll see the verse does not say that God foreknew facts, but rather it says he foreknew particular persons. Multiple times in that verse he says, for those whom, for those whom. He's not talking about facts, he's talking about people. And when the New Testament speaks of God foreknowing, it's always speaking of people. Every time this comes up, and not, rather, facts. And those people are the objects specifically of God's redemption plan. If this is simple foreknowledge, as it's referred to in the Arminian view of information, then why even mention this in in Romans chapter 8? If he's saying, well, yeah, we know that God is omniscient and he knows all facts, he knows all things, but that would have to conclude then that He knows everybody, and so everybody's going to be saved, which really just leads to universalism, which is clearly not taught in Scripture. So we know that not everyone will be saved. This isn't referring to facts. Rather, it's referring to God's perfectly purposed relational knowledge. When Paul declares that God has foreknown individuals, he's indicating that God has determined to set his electing love and favor on them. He's setting them apart for an intimate, personal, saving relationship with him. Not only does that make sense in this text, but if you continue reading the rest of this section, the whole next section in Romans chapter 8 is about God's everlasting love, where Paul actually says, who can separate us from the love of Christ? It seems like Paul's argument, it's very linear, he's a roller coaster ride and you're on the tracks and you're going you're going forward and he's taking you logically through his argument and he's talking about foreknowledge as this first domino and it's supposed to indicate to us God's amazing love unstoppable love and plan 
So what we would see here, according to these passages, this isn't talking about God foreseeing man's choice of him and then choosing them, but rather speaking of God's for loving, for loved choice, set his love upon them. So we would say that foreknowledge equals for loved. So how do foreknowledge, though, and predestination relate to election? Why use different terms? Why does scripture not just have one term that we're talking through? Glad you asked. Predestination actually speaks of election from the perspective of God's sovereignty. So when he's predestining something, he's saying, my will, my power to accomplish it will stand. And when he speaks of foreknowledge, as we've seen in this text, text, he's speaking of uh, election from the perspective of God's love. Love is really a key word whenever you're thinking about the doctrine of election. And we ought to see that that's how scripture presents it. We cannot detach God's love from his power in regards to the doctrine of election. And whenever we come to God's character, we need to keep it unified. We cannot separate it, segment it out, and exalt one characteristic over the other. Now, having worked through several passages, we have set the table to address the big question. What is this basis for election? Let's look at what scripture says. Romans chapter 10, verse 20. And Paul is is actually um, quotes Isaiah here. And he says um, in the book of Isaiah, I have been found by those who did not seek me. And he's talking about this idea of election and who will be saved. And he says, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. It's interesting when you read that verse, thinking through the Arminian view, there's no initial response here or choice toward God. Rather, it seems that God is the one doing all the work, doing the action. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul's writing to the church at Corinth, and he says, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. Why did God choose this way? so that no human being might boast. So that no one can boast in what they have done. And he says specifically in the presence of God. There's no boasting. There's no work of man that's involved in God's choice. It was specifically chosen. Why? So that God can get all the glory. We see this over and over again in Scripture as a theme. Romans chapter 9 It says, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, and Paul says, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, he says, but because of him who calls. She, being Rebecca, was told by, um, told, we see this in Genesis, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. So we see Paul's explaining God's election and uses specific people, an example, in, this, in the book of Genesis, which every Hebrew person, every believer at the time, that was their Bible. They knew the first five books of the Old Testament. And he says, Jacob, I loved, Esau, I hated. They weren't born yet and had done nothing, good or bad. There's nothing that they did that resulted in God's choosing. But he says, this is God's purpose of election. Not because of works, but because of him who calls. Romans chapter 11 also speaks to this. It says, but what is God's reply to Elijah? He says, I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal or Baal. And so, he says in the next verse, so too at this present time there is a remnant referring to Israel. And how how were these people chosen? He says, chosen by grace. Now, To be honest with the text here, we're talking about a specific group of people. We're not talking about all believers, but it's helpful for us to see what God describes his choosing as, and he defends it, right? He says, but if it is by grace, his choosing, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. So if we believe that salvation is by grace, and we believe what God's word says about election, then it has to be by God alone. If there's anything that God's basing his decision on in man, 
then it's not a gift. It's something we earn. It's something we're doing to merit God's choice. There is nothing in us or nothing done by mankind that invokes God to choose us for salvation. If it was that way, it wouldn't be a gift, a free gift. And since it is a free gift, a choice of God's according to his good pleasure, there is no conditions, no constraints, as we saw earlier. So we would say that the basis for God's election is unconditional. That God's choice in eternity past is unconditioned on anything in man. It's according to his purpose. And biblically, we must hold to a position of unconditional election. And doctrinally, this is absolutely necessary according to what we just talked about last week, total depravity. If man is helpless apart from God, unable to save ourselves, if we are dead in our sins, we need God to choose us. We are totally dependent on God for him to be merciful to sinners, unworthy of his grace. But what about good works? Why is there so much confusion about um, this idea of faith in Christ? And they're putting it, um, we would say, the cart before the horse. How do these fit together with unconditional election? Well, let's look at what Scripture says. Scripture says that these um, good works and uh, this act of faith and trusting and believing in Christ is actually the results and confirmation of election. Ephesians 2 says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what purpose? For good works. So once we have been made new and made alive in Christ, that's when good works that God prepared beforehand are meant to be done. It's interesting in John 15, Jesus is talking to his disciples here and he says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed. So I chose you and then appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Interesting parallel. Also we see in 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter lays out all these good works and fruit in the life of godliness that are necessary. And he says, Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. He says, if you practice these qualities, you will never fail. What he's saying is if there's fruit in your life, there will, that will show out and it will prove where the root of your salvation is. It's in God's choosing in eternity past. We see this picture over and over again. When you think about um, a tree and its roots, Scripture is constantly emphasizing this fact that it's not the root. Good works and faith is not the root of salvation, but rather it's the fruit born out of those who have been saved. We need to understand that and put this in the right order so that we are not um, placing man's will over God's. These character qualities are meant to confirm um, not to qualify us for election. All right, last topic we want to cover in regards to scriptures, reprobation. Reprobation, before we talk about definitions about it, we need to understand, first and foremost, that God has no obligation. God has no obligation to save anyone. He has no obligation to save everyone, and he's not even obligated to provide equal opportunity to everyone. What we need to understand is that according to God's word, salvation is by grace, which means it's a free gift. If God was obligated to save people, then it wouldn't be a gift. It would be something he owes them. We need to understand that God has no obligation to save anyone. But in regards to this definition of reprobation, let's see um, some verses, some verses here that speak to this topic. First, a definition. The free and sovereign choice of God made in eternity past, this is what reprobation means, to pass over certain individuals, choosing not to set his saving love on them, but instead determining to punish them for their sins unto the magnification of his justice. Let's look at some verses together. Proverbs 16 says, The Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. Jude verse 4 says, For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were destined for this condemnation. 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 3 says, And in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. 
and most commonly understood or known in Romans chapter 9 speaks very clearly to this. Right after that passage we read where God says that um, Jacob I have loved and Esau I hated. In verse 14, Paul continues, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? He says, by no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, he continues, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then, he has mercy on whom he wills, and he hardens whom he wills. A question that might come to our mind is, well, who can resist the will of God? And that's exactly what Paul goes to next. He says, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For whom can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Well, what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make his power known, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory? In this doctrine of reprobation, we need to be... um, clear that it's, it's not the same as what's referred to as the doctrine of equal ultimacy. The doctrine of equal ultimacy says that God's action in election and God's action in reprobation are perfectly symmetrical. So that God is just as active in the working of an unbelieving heart of the reprobate as he is in working in the faith in the heart of the elect. We see that even here in Romans chapter 9. This isn't Um, A position that's just, well, that kind of makes me feel good, and so I want to just kind of make this loophole so it doesn't make me feel sticky. We actually see it in this text. In Romans chapter 9, when he says, vessels of mercy which he has prepared beforehand, it's in the active voice, meaning that that's referring to God's election, and he's actively doing something. Yet, we see in contrast, the statement where it says, vessels of wrath prepared for destruction is in the passive voice. There's a different tense here in which statements are being made. And we need to understand that Scripture actually holds this view in regards to God's work in choosing to save versus passing over for those that are sinners in rebellion against God. Having covered um, all these Scripture verses on unconditional election, you may have some questions running through your head or even questions that you've had. And so we'd like to look at some of those. I think it would be better for us, rather than rushing through these, Um, to look at some of them next week. So we're going to go through several questions next week. But what I'd like to do with our remaining time is talk about how we should think about election, how we should think about this doctrine of election. As we meditate on these truths this week, we need to understand that God's power and God's love is present in the doctrine of election. Love is not impressive because of who gets it, but rather because of who gives it. We need to understand this. And one um, illustration I heard this week that I am totally commandeering was the idea of a woman. When she's born, she's a little girl, she can be raised with this idea in her head that I am supposed to be worthy of love. I need to look attractive. I need to earn a man's love, earn his affection. And she grows up and she's beautified herself and she hooks herself a man who's just doting on her and adores her. She's beautiful. They get married. And then, boom, boom car crash happens. Her face is scarred, burned, can't even identify her, and she becomes a paraplegic. Even worse, maybe a quadriplegic. She can't do anything. There's nothing appealing or attractive to her. So from the outside looking in, if that man was to leave that woman, what would we say? We would say he never really loved her. He never really loved her. But if that man stays faithful to her, we would say, whoa, he really loves her. He really loves her. And we want love that way. 
We don't really want superficial love, but the world and our sinful hearts craze this sort of, I earn it, I deserve it, I merit it type of love, and that's not what we see in God's election. But when we see something more precious, more beautiful, and the danger in election that oftentimes plagues us as students of God's word is we can fall into this danger of self-focus. Well, I don't really like it because it doesn't make it feel really personal for me. Your name is written down. It is very personal. And it feels like sometimes we think of the doctrine of election in a detached or there's this begrudging, neutral feeling type mentality towards this doctrine of election. We either get caught into this self-focus that, wow, I'm so special, God loves me, 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 me. Or we get into this thing that, well, it's not really personal, so it kind of feels detached. And what we see in Scripture, and I hope you've seen this morning, is that God has amazingly put his delight in his people to make them his own despite their unworthiness, despite their sinfulness. And that is true love. That's amazing, powerful love. I was thinking of the hymn this week, my worth is not in what I own, not in the strength of flesh and bone, but it's in the costly wounds of love at the cross. First John chapter 3, John writes, behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us, that we should be called sons of God. And this morning, we need to behold the love of God. We need to see God's amazing love in choosing sinners. This week, I myself was wrestling through this idea of election and trying to understand how to capture this, how to transfer it from head to heart. And I was ultimately just driven to prayer. I was asking the Lord to help me understand. I want my heart to be activated and submitted to these truths. And an illustration came to mind for me personally in studying through this that really helped me to grasp, I think, of of an old married couple. They can look back over 50, 60, 75 years of marriage, and they see all these years of love, and oftentimes they can track back and recount these amazing events throughout their life of the grandkids graduating high school and their kids getting married and have kids for the first time, and they graduated high school, and you keep rewinding the clock and you see their their children being born and all these precious moments. And you can go all the way back to your wedding day, which is this huge climactic event. And in regards to a parallel to scripture here, the wedding event would be like salvation. That's when uh, salvation is applied to the heart of a believer. But what election does is it rewinds further. It goes further back, even before there's engagement and a commitment and a promise and a pursuit. You see this moment in people's lives, and maybe some of you men have experienced this and think back to it, where in your own mind, you saw this woman and you said, I'm going to marry her. You haven't bought a ring. You have no idea from our position what's going to happen. But you, you kind of have that moment. You talk to your dad or your mom and, or you're talking to yourself in your head and he says, I'm going to marry her. I choose her. That's the first domino that falls when a man decides, I'm going to marry her. And he makes a choice and he commits to it and he pursues it. And that's what God did in this doctrine of election. The beauty of it is that God in eternity past, he made a choice and he said, I choose you. In the Old Testament, he says, I'm coming for you. In the June Testament, he says, I'm here for you. In the church age, he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you and I'm always going to be with you, even to the end of the age. And there's this promise in the future where he says, I am coming back for you. And all of those beautiful promises start with God saying, I choose you. What an amazing act of love that's unmerited and undeserved, that unfolds all these amazing promises and faithfulness of God's love in our life. We need to behold the love of God, and we need to understand that this is a beautiful and precious doctrine, a beautiful and precious gift. So next week, uh, we're planning on continuing our study through soteriology, and we're, we were hoping to do a Q&A, and I think what we'll do is we'll start out with some of these questions. There's questions that you have, and we want to address some even passages that people would disagree because of Scripture, and we want to look at those and address those. So we may do a Q&A next week um, mixed in with some teaching, 
and try to combo that, or we may just do what might be called a defense of the defense of election, as one author wrote it. So um, we'll look through that. Some resources, if you have continued reading desires or questions, you can email those to us. Please do. We want to hear your questions and discuss further. But uh, one resource I wanted to mention is Chosen for Life by Sam Storms. Um, it was a resource that was helpful in teaching this doctrine. It would be a huge blessing to you to walk through Scripture and what this means. So be sure to check out those resources for your continued reading as well. With that, we're dismissed, and we'll see you back here in a few minutes.